what we really do better than anybody else is we get involved, we become really a partner in the business, and we help entrepreneurs strategize and guide their company in a much more effective way just because we've got the experience in the line of sight to be like, hey, look, the people that come in after you, the people with experience, the people with more reps doing what you're gonna do, we know what they're gonna want and look for. We know how they're gonna attack this piece. We know how they're gonna try to take you down in valuation. So from getting involved early, we can help you shore those things up. We can help you build those things up so that you have less weaknesses and a lot more strengths by the time you go do the exit. Ryan Lewendon, co-founder of Gianuzzi Lewendon LLP, is at the forefront of legal services for emerging consumer brands. Since establishing the firm with Nicholas Gianuzzi in 2011, he has played a pivotal role in guiding high-growth companies through complex legal landscapes. With a client list boasting household names like Vitamin Water and Body Armor, Ryan's expertise has been instrumental in their rapid growth and successful exits. In this episode, we uncover the fascinating story behind the company's ascent to prominence. Ryan discusses the firm's entrepreneurial beginnings, the strategic moves that have cemented their reputation, and the dynamic relationships they've built with some of the most notable brands in the industry. Welcome back to Turning Pro Season 2, Episode 6. Today we have Ryan Lewendon, who is the founder of Gianuzzi and Lewendon. Thanks for joining us today, Ryan. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm so pumped to be here. So Adrian and I were talking about this before you showed up, but you have like had your hands in what seems like every single major consumer deal that has happened since I can remember, since I've been in this space. And I think I'm just so curious to understand like what you started with to get to where you are today in terms of like having the ability to be at the forefront of everything going on in this ecosystem. Yeah, like, you know, we've done a great job developing like a real specific niche, like in the legal field. I would say we are the go-to for consumer facing businesses in the consumer products industry. And, you know, we started in there with like, we got this great experience, but it was very much by happenstance. Uh, my partner, Nick and I, we worked at a bigger firm. Uh, we were corporate lawyers and, um, you know, the firm had a long time real estate client whose son was an entrepreneur and who had started a bunch of projects that didn't work out, went through bankruptcy, came back around. And eventually the dad like kind of went to Nick and was like, Hey, my son's starting another business. It's a water company you gotta watch over him because he keeps, he keeps going to bankruptcy, right? And um, you know, the, the, uh, the guy was Darius Bikoff and the company uh, that was the water company ended up becoming vitamin water. And so you know, Nick and I had this really amazing opportunity to get in really at the ground floor of a brand that became very transcendental in the CPG business, right? And we kind of did everything for that business, right? Like you know, all the rounds of financing, built the distribution network, supply chain, all the celebrity partnerships, like 50 cents deal with like vitamin water, where you had like, you know, his, his equity in the brand and his own flavor and royalties on that product, like was one of, my, one of my first deals I worked at at a law school, you know, Jennifer Aniston's deal, which became like one of the longest running CPG partnerships of all time. I think it went like, like 10 years after the sale to Coke even. Um, and we did everything through the sale, right? We did the sale to Coke, uh, 2007, 2008, you know, $4.8 billion, you know, like a 13 X off trailing revenues. And, um, you know, it accounted for this huge shift in wealth, right? The cap table of vitamin water was just filled with almost every employee, you know, like the, the secretaries at vitamin water made like a million bucks each, right? Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, the sales folks were making five, 10, 15 million bucks each, right? Ooh. And, um, and, and a lot of those people went back and got involved with the things they knew, right? So they went and got back involved in CPG and we started getting phone calls, you know, from those folks because we were like the only lawyers that they knew. And we're like, oh, I'm starting a pretzel company or, you know, I'm starting a, an energy company or whatnot. And um, we started to realize like, oh, wow, maybe there's like, maybe there is something there, you know, in this industry to go represent more of these companies. And we went um, to our first expo, Expo East, 2007, Boston. Uh, Nick and I took uh, one of my friends from college who had started a organic soda company in New Orleans. And we took the train up to Boston to go introduce him to Mike Rapoli, 
who's the president of uh, Vitamin Water, and like show him the soda and see what he thought, right? And as part of doing that, we walked around. And like, you know, we had like our little business cards and we were like, you know, hey, we're lawyers. Anybody need a lawyer? And people were like, well, like, I'm not getting sued right now, so I don't know like what you want. And be like, no, 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 that's not what we help. We were like Vitamin Wars lawyers and we help you like structure rounds of financing, build your infrastructure. We help make sure there's like parity between the founders and the investors as they come in. Um, and we help you grow and help you sell. And people are like, oh, oh shit, yeah, I need you. Like I had like six employees, now I have 68. But like my lawyer is uh, my uncle's friend's like, you know, best friend who's a trust and estates lawyer. And they don't know what like a bill back is and they don't know what a pallet is and they don't know, you know, who big geyser is. And I just, I would love to have someone with some contextual experience so I don't need to educate them, you know, on, on the actual industry in order to sort of do the law. And we left that show with like, Vita Coco and like happy baby organic baby food and hint water and Siggy's yogurt and Pirates Broody and Pretzel Crisp, like all his new clients, right? And they were all companies that were doing, you know, a couple million dollars in revenues about at the time. And those are all businesses that we subsequently helped like scale and grow and, you know, kind of repeat the playbook uh, and help sell for, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or like Vita Coco's case, we helped them go public for like a billion. Um, and, you know, we built our, our client base up to maybe like 30 businesses. Um, and then we left in, in January, 2011, we left that firm, started this firm. We, uh, we rented this space in the meatpacking district, which was like ambient space above, uh, one of our few hospitality clients that we had, like right above their corporate office uh, on 14th and 10th. And it was like me, Nick and this guy, Anthony that we brought. And then I, you know, we hired a, we hired a, a office manager off, off Craigslist, actually. <laughs> this woman, Brianna, who was like the absolute most important hire ever because she like was so cool and like she like worked in enter entertainment like UTA before. So like when clients came in and we're still building the office and it wasn't filled out, she was able to greet them and bring them to like the conference room. People like wouldn't notice that like things weren't built just because she had such a great presence. Um, but it was the four of us and, and you know, we kind of grew up from there. And so today we've got you know, 35 lawyers, we've got uh, actually like two floors uh, in that same place on 14th Street, and, and we've got an office in Santa Monica, and we work with like probably close to like 2,500 companies in CPG um, across, you know, across stage, you know, from, you know, kind of mid-market growth venture, kind of like a third, a third, a third, and then across categories from like food and beverage, we've branched out from, you know, food and beverage to beauty, uh, to spirits, to vitamins, mineral supplements, to baby, to pet, uh, to some apparel, but it's all still like very much, it's all CPG, it's only the consumer facing companies and it is life cycle counsel. Like we, what we really do better than anybody else is we get involved, we become like really a partner in the business and we help entrepreneurs strategize and guide their company in a much more effective way um, just because we've got the experience in the line of sight to be like, hey, look, the people that come in after you, the people with experience, right? The people with like more reps doing what you're gonna do, we know what they're gonna want and look for. We know how they're gonna attack this piece. We know how they're gonna try to take you down in valuation. So from getting involved early, we can help you shore those things up. We can help you build those things up so that you have less weaknesses and a lot more strengths by the time you go do the exit. Uh, so it's a very rewarding practice. It's very tactile. It's long term. Um, I don't have, which is unlike a lot of law firms, especially in MA, I have, like, I don't have very short term relationships. I don't meet a company right when they're about to sell, typically. We've done it, but not typically. And, like, have like a three month relationship. I have like five, seven, 10 year relationships with these clients. Um, and it's a great way for me to practice law because it, 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 it's much more rewarding, it's much more tactile, and you develop a much closer bond with with the businesses and the people that you're working with. I talk about this a lot actually, and especially on the podcast where it feels a lot easier to do business with people who feel like friends versus it's like a transaction with another business on the other side of the table because you actually genuinely feel like by the time you're really friends, you're helping each other and you're not like sitting there nickel and diving each other and it doesn't get like uncomfortable and weird. I, I totally agree. Like, um, you know, Michael Poli always says success is best shared. Success is best when shared. And, and I, wholeheartedly agree with that right and outside of like you know just like 
never having to work, I think like the best thing you can do is work only with the people that you like and respect and care about, right? And to be in that position today, I feel so absolutely lucky, you know? Because look, when we were starting out, you know, we didn't know, we, we didn't know, we had no idea. Like we, when we started it, 2011, you know, we moved out, we had 30 clients, which was a lot, but like, are they gonna stay clients? Are they gonna move with us? Like, they're not forced to pay us, and we build by the hour, so it's like, I don't know how much they'll use this or not. You kind of take anything that comes along because you have to, but to be in a spot where my day every day is really only filled with people that I really care about, respect, uh, admire, and that, you know, who I want to enrich their lives, like, I think that is, I just feel so lucky to be in that spot. I think that's the prime spot. Like you can be in a career. I love that. I'm curious. I feel like in the early days, you know, you're running a startup. I've run a startup for a couple of years now and we both started in service based. And so in the early days, it feels like you're pushing and pushing and pushing just to try to get someone to like come knock on your door. And you're lucky if anyone comes inbound, it's probably through customer referrals and things yeah. in the early days. And then there's a point, you guys have experienced it, verbatim has experienced it, where all of a sudden something's flipped. And it, it's a combination of good work, talent, great marketing. It, it's a combination of a lot of things that all of a sudden you wake up and you don't even realize the transition, but people are knocking on your door. You have 10 sales calls a day. And you're like, how did this happen? And so I'm curious what, I'm sure there's a phase where you woke up one morning and you're like, turning pro. Things have Exactly. <laughs> Things have changed. What, what was that moment for you? For your yeah. context, that is the premise of this podcast. It's trying to understand those moments where you wake up and you're like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say, you know, I'd say when it really started to click that, you know, we were going to be able to kind of like pick and choose what we were doing. It was fairly early on when we started. I think it might have been 2013 or 14. And, you know, we'd, we'd, Happy Baby had been a long-term client, um, but we were working on a deal with them for Danone, which went through, and then we were working on a, a deal with Blueprint to a uh, Haines Celestial, kind of at the same time, right? And when those, and, and we got them both done kind of simultaneously, but like once those things hit, you know, law firms and, and service businesses are very much pinned against your successes, right? Um, people tend to not care about how many times you've <laughs> struck out. They really care about how many home runs you've hit. Um, so from a marketing perspective, like once those things went through, um, just the inbox started to become a lot busier. Um, for, for us, just because we had such a, like, and still have it, an inch wide, mile deep niche. Like the first couple of years were a lot of customer referrals and everything like that. But it started to be like, you know, getting emails from people like, oh, I saw the press release or like, oh, like, you know, I just read something about you guys. It started to move from like a direct customer referral who liked you and was like, you got to use these guys. I've got a real affinity for them to kind of like cold outreach. And and honestly, you know, we were able to and I would say we did this just by working very, very, very hard, kind of like that first maybe 10 years of the firm, we were able to do it without a lot of real outreach, like without actively doing outreach. Like Nick and I went to the shows, we went to like kind of the top shows every year. And you know, that was a lot of outreach and a lot of, you know, top of mind and, and a lot of biz dev, but without doing like, you know, a ton more than that, we we're able to build and scale the business to about like, maybe like 15 lawyers. Um, and, uh, I think like once that started happening is when we really started to feel like I like, you know, I was like renting a, a really bad studio on the Upper East Side, like when we first started, like with paper thin walls. And I was like commuting, you know, kind of to the meat packing every day, which is like the, there's no easy way to get there. I think it was like when that kind of started happening, I was like, all right, I feel comfortable enough. I'm going to go move to Chelsea. So it's like walking distance, you know, triple the rent <laughs> type thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was definitely a kind of like the first turning point for us there. What, looking back, what would you say are the most important aspects of relationship building as someone who, from what it sounds like, you've built a lot of, if not most of your business off of being good at relationships? Yeah, look, I, I think like maybe number one, two and three is authenticity. You know, um, I think that is the bedrock of relationship building. Um, and I think, you know, 
a lot of times why people don't lead with that, especially when they're younger, is because they're concerned like, hey, being myself is going to exclude certain people from, from that funnel, right? Um, which is true. It always will, right? Like if you are a diehard Yankees fan, there's going to be a diehard Dodgers fan that doesn't want to work with you because <laughs> you're diehard, right? So, but, you know, relationships that are built on sort of the authentic you are the strongest ones. Um, and the ones that aren't, you know, are really just, just sort of superficial business relationships, which is okay. But, you know, like every relationship, things have their ups and downs. They have their difficult times, right? And when you're working with businesses that are fast-growing, scalable businesses, like having an authentic, real relationship is what keeps the client, right? Like there's a point when a company... You know, I've had businesses tell me, hey, look, we've staved off getting in-house counsel, even though like probably economically that's the thing we should do because we wouldn't interface with you as much, you know? And, um, and, and that feels great. I never really push that. I never tell anybody not to get the in-house counsel. I think it's, you know, but like that is a testament to sort of the bond we've developed with a lot of our clients, not just me, but like the other lawyers in the firm. Um, and, you know, like... I, but there is a point where, as any service provider, right, like your, your client outgrows you. Like at a certain point, you know, you become so big, like all the biggest firms and all the biggest agents and all the biggest wealth managers, like that's who they want to work with. They get to a certain size and everybody jumps on and will offer them the whole world, right? And in those instances, the only time you don't lose a client, and, and we rarely often do, is when they're like, well, no, I'm not leaving because of the relationship, because what we've developed and a lot of times it's because, hey, look, the entrepreneur feels that I understand them as well, right? And that's so important, like for an advisor, right? Like if you're advised on the other side of things, if you're an entrepreneur and like you have advisors around you and they don't really understand you, how can they give you great advice? How can they actually help you? It's like your therapist. Like if you lie to your therapist, you're not going to get, <laughs> you're not getting a good, good result, right? Like if you're inauthentic with the advisors you put around yourself, you're just not going to get the best advice. You're not going to be the best part of you. And because they're, they're just not, it's not going to be because they're bad. It's because they've got imperfect info. Um, yeah. So authenticity. I think when it comes to authenticity in business relationships specifically, like in the context of a sales cycle, as an example, I think the coolest ones are when you're not even, when you're not even thinking about being authentic or like, do I like this person? Those are the best ones where all of a sudden you're working together and you didn't, you, you didn't even realize yeah. like when Ben and I met, in four weeks, we just, we put down, to, we'd already ordered equipment. Like we, the second time we met was at Best Buy and <laughs> like the card was out and we were just paying for equipment. True like, story. There was no, like, do I think, do I like this person? Does he fit with my values? Right. You're kind of just doing something. And, and same with clients. Like a lot of the clients we work with, again, not everyone needs to be your best friend, but a lot of the ones that I have become friends with, there's no even discussion of contract. You're kind of just chopping it up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we've been working together for like three months. Well, look, I think a lot of times the best business development occurs when you go into, you know, professional environment and you go in there without much of an agenda other than getting to know the person. Yep. Right. Because like I see it like and when I was younger, I used to do it like you go to a work event and you're like, all right, I need to get X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Right. And like you can see the people like you can. Like you can feel the people when they're going and they're talking and they're doing stuff who are like, who don't really care what you're talking about in the back of their mind. They're trying to get to some, some, some result. Right. And like that'll work. I don't know, one out of 10 times, but if you just go and get to know people, right. Like maybe, maybe it doesn't lead somewhere. Maybe you get to know someone and then they hire you in five years or 10 years or whatever it is. But like, I think it does have a higher rate of return in terms of good business, right? In terms of good business relationships, because one, you get to know the person, you understand the person, but like most people, when you're, when you're talking about hiring someone or, or like buying their company or, or when you're selling to someone, like one of the most important things is like, do I wanna be around this person, you know? Do I wanna talk to this person? Do they make my skin crawl, you know? <laughs> Or, 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 do, or do I enjoy it? Like, do, or, do I, or do I get some benefit that maybe isn't even 
just directly through, through the sales part, right? Like people come to our firm, not just because of the amazing legal work we do. They come to our firm because, you know, we are so entrenched in this industry. Like we offer so many things outside of that and so many insights and connections and introductions and, and just ability to connect dots. Um, but that's totally non-legal, right? But, but it, is, it is something that people like value so highly that sometimes the core part is just secondary to it. How, how do you think about like how your firm has evolved compared to other traditional law firms where it's like, I, I think people know you as like a lawyer and a legal firm, but you're way more than that as you just alluded to. But I don't think every law firm has had the ability to carve themselves out to, with that public persona. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> You know, from, an, from a law firm standpoint, we have such a unique positioning in that like, we're just such an inch wide mile deep, right? And that sort of begets a lot of other opportunities just sort of becoming like industry, known in the industry, experiencing the industry, being educated in pieces of the industry, having relationships that are sort of, you know, non-client relationships, but like, you know, business relationships um, that are complementary in the industry. Um, and then also doing one thing, right? Like we only do corporate M&A. Like if you get sued, you don't want me representing you because I don't know what the hell I'm doing in a courtroom. <laughs> like it would go absolutely terribly, right? But, you know, but I've got a network of people all outsourced to outside the firm. And people are like, why don't you do litigation? Why don't you do trademark filings? I'm like, look, I love doing what we're the best at. And I have people I know that are the best at what they do. I'll give it to them. Just work with the best people, right? Most law firms to grow, you got to add partners and people start to say, I've got to get broader and broader and broader. And eventually you're kind of so broad that you're kind of like, just like everybody else, right? My sort of ethos has been, there's enough here to grow, you know, to hundred lawyers plus just doing what we're doing. But also because we're small and because, you know, we're boutique, um, you know, with like 35 lawyers, you know, it, it's relatively still small, but like it does allow us to get involved in businesses in a much deeper way. It's allowed us to, you know, invest in businesses. It's allowed us to, you know, add other roles that are more sort of strategic um, to sort of our service offerings that like a traditional law firm couldn't do, right? Once you add people that aren't sort of like doing exactly the same thing, it sort of starts to become a little too bureaucratic. Especially, look, when you get a bunch of lawyers involved, right? <laughs> you know? How do you think about, you brought up an interesting point, which is the investment piece. Like, what is, do you have anyone on the team that is, like, investment focused? Is it just kind of you guys as lawyers knowing what you're looking for? And then I'd be curious to know how you think about an opportunity where you want to invest versus just be, like, a service provider. Yeah. So, um, we don't have anyone on the team that's investment focused. Um, I will say that, you know, at least all the partners, and we've got six partners, um, are so specialized in CPG um, that like, and probably none of them can work a freaking spreadsheet, but like <laughs> they're so specialized in CPG that like all the sort of indicators of success they can, they can see, right? Like, you know, if you're a beverage and like Big Geyser is taking you in New York, like that's an, that's an indicator of success, you know? Um, if you're a beauty product and like Sephora is taking you on, like that's one of the indicators of success, right? And so from our line of sight, we're able to see a lot of those indicators. And, you know, I've got enough of a financial wherewithal to like understand, hey, look, this is generally what people want. Do you have these things? Like, do you have a good margin? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Are you capital efficient? So um, we've got the skill set. And, you know, um, and my partner, Nick, like recently, you know, he even transitioned from lawyering to, you know, just investing with the Humble Growth Company. Um, you know, I'm running the law firm these days, but, you know, Nick is Nick is out running Humble Growth. Um, which is that is your just, investment arm? I don't uh, think I'm that, familiar that's not, with that. It's totally separate, totally separate company. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humble Growth is totally separate and Nick's a GP on that. And that's kind of where he spends like 98% of his time. Um, and that's really a testament to kind of our line of sight and our experience in this, you know, humble growth is doing CPG generally, but it's not doing tech or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, in terms of like, in terms of looking at companies that, you know, you want to invest in, um, 
you know, like the rule of thumb is like you want to invest in the companies that you can't invest in, right? And the companies that people are begging to invest in, you generally probably don't, you know? Um, and the great thing about the position we're sitting in is like, because of the relationships and because of, you know, because people do see us as value add, we get lots of opportunities to invest in businesses that nobody else can invest in. Um, and so that's just a very sort of binary yeah. um, rule of thumb for us. But then like when you kind of take that down a little bit more, like let's say you're talking about something pre-revenue or you're talking about something really early on, like you're kind of looking at like, you know, you're looking at the, the founder, the person, you're looking at the product, right? And you're looking at like the sort of, you know, you're looking at the timing, right? Like, is this the right person, product, and the right time, right? Because plenty of products have come out a little too early or a little too late um, that would have been just absolutely home run smashes if they, if they hit the timing exactly right. But I think those things, those three things are the most important. And, you know, it kind of goes, I think it goes, you know, person, timing, product in terms of like, especially early on, right? Like the founder is almost everything. Like, are they running through walls? You know, are they going to, like, how easily are they going to give up? You know, what is their, what is their ultimate desire? You know, do they have a track record with this, right? Like, you know, I mean, second time founders can be hit or miss depending on, you know, what's the motivation, right? Like the founder that's got that burning fire, that had the exit, but that can't stay at home, you know, and, and kind of needs to do it. Like you bet on that person every time. Um, you know, the founder that, you know, could take it or leave it second time. They just, you know, they have some friends that need a little bit more money and they're, and they're kind of doing this. You see them, like they come and they get funded and, you know, they don't take off. So much, so much early success is just about that founder's, force of will just pushing it out there yeah i want to talk about your mindset about not moving into adjacent verticals or different icps because in theory kind of standing where you guys are now you've had a ton of success it's easy to say looking back oh you know we stayed in this icp and i was never tempted to go outside of it i'm sure there have been moments where this really hip well-funded b2b SaaS company within the cpg or supply chain ecosystem raised a ton of money and wants to go work with you and you're staring down a big money sign were there tempting moments or did you guys try it, realize it wasn't for you? The, look, we've done it like on rare occasion and it's usually been because it's been a friend of the firm, a founder who moved over. But I tell them, I'm like, look, like if you're in CPG and you're starting a company, I think wholeheartedly there's nobody better than us to do it. If you're starting a tech company, like I won't screw it up. But there's probably people, there's probably a lot of people just as good as me, and there's probably a couple people that are a lot better, right? And that add a lot more. And, you know, sometimes people are like, well, we want to use you anyways, you know. <laughs> when that comes around, right, we'll, we'll, we'll I'm, tell, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know? I mean, everyone knows this, but it's like the sales where you don't give someone the time of day. 100%. Are the, Dude, we had a, my co-founder and I like we've just been hiring like crazy and we're understaffed because our growth has been better than we could have expected. And there was one particular prospect where like we just like dropped the ball between the two of us and communication of who was following up. And this guy said three follow up emails like a holding company of like seven brands. He's like, I'm waiting for you guys. I'm waiting for you guys. And I was just like laughing to myself like, OK, at some point. You obviously got to like respond and it was it was a genuine mistake but i was like this guy is like craving what we can offer him more because it seems as though we were neglecting him although it was a an honest mistake but he's like coming back and it's psychology and i feel like that's a very simple sales thing that you learn but it becomes funnier when like it's not even on purpose and it's just genuine you're like hey man i'm a cpg lawyer like i don't really yeah. specialize in tech like we don't care we still really want to use you because we've seen all these press releases of all the crazy things you've done yeah yeah um, yeah, and, and then look, I mean, from a, from a pure business standpoint, there's so many efficiencies like in what we do that I'm able to work, like a, a company that's just starting out, we can service that business same way we service a business that's doing a billion dollars in revenues, right? Now, we're gonna take our more junior lawyers, but like we've got the database of knowledge that like a founder just starting out, like the stuff they're doing, it's kind of like in the box, like the initial stuff. But then even the like the first couple things that might have some industry specificity where like somebody that doesn't know what they're doing is gonna have to like 
figure it out. Like, is this right? Is this wrong? Like, is this even okay to ask for? We've got, like, they're going to deal with that party. I've done 100 deals with that party. And we're going to be able to go to our database and say, look, generally, for where you're situated, they might accept some of these things, right? Like, this is general, in the general, everything's, everything's bespoke, right? Like, every, every relationship's the same. Like, maybe they don't like you that much. Who knows? But, like, I can tell you with very, very good certainty that these are reasonable things and that this makes sense. It will hit you market. In CPG, I can do that up and down the line, right? And so, Wait, you mean, so? No, sorry to cut you off. You have like a yeah. database of like clauses or behaviors that are like consistent with certain like investment firms or people that you can like look back on? More or less. That's a crazy generally. concept as a business in and of itself. Yeah, more or less, right? And and I've got, you know, multiple, multiple uh, interactions with the different firms and the different, and the different acquirers, right? So like, you know, we're able to make it efficient early on. And later on, we're able to make it really value add, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, like, you know, I, in beverage, there's no other law firm, I think, that sold a business to Coke and it sold a business to Pepsi and it sold a business to KDP other than us, right? And like, you know, KDP, I don't know, they've signed up like, I don't know, five outside brands or 10 or whatever. I think we've done like, I don't know, four to six deals with KDP for their national distribution, right? So like a lot of these, a lot of examples like that where, you know, anybody else walking in a situation is gonna be starting from zero and they're gonna have to figure all this out. You know, we, we move that line up a lot further. So, you know, you, I, I step outside that. I don't know, I don't know, I'm, you know, I can figure it out, but like I don't have all of that benefit, right? And that really allows us in where we work to add this really efficient, really sort of like strategy-based legal work that I think no one else can offer because of that experience set. And stepping outside that, you know, you drop, drop off a cliff and we're like everybody else. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, for me, it's always made sense. Even when I started, like when I started out, when I was lawyering, like before vitamin water, when I was doing corporate law, like in my mind, I was like, look, the way the law world is, you need to be doing something where you can have a differentiation, right? And law is also like an old person's game, right? Which I'm, I'm now am, right? But like back then, I was like, how do you get good at something quickly? And I looked at like, like what commercial real estate lawyers were doing in the city, and they were just getting slammed, right? Because like there's a like dime a dozen, it's hard to differentiate yourself, all the, all the information's out there, it's just relationships, right? And so I was looking for something that I could get could get into where not a lot of people were focusing. It was a growth, it was a growth area and become an expert in really quick. Like if I was, if I was like, you know, if I was coming out of law school now, I'd be going into AI law, right? Like, or if it was last year, it'd be uh, web, web three, three. <laughs> or then it would be crypto, you know, but like, and then it'd be cannabis, like whatever, like whatever the new part is that's developing that like, you know, there are no experts in AI, right? They're the lying to you if they tell you they are. <laughs> <laughs> the, or the expert in AI has been an expert for like five years, right? There's yeah. nobody with like probably 20 years. Maybe there is. If that person's there's sees probably this, sorry. a couple. But like, yeah, yeah. But like, it's so nascent that you can become an expert in it relatively quickly. Um, so I was always looking for something like that. And like, you know, the vitamin water thing presented itself. And it was, I was always into health and wellness. So like, going deep into that always made sense to me yeah. because of that competitive moat that was, that was creatable. How do you think about? longevity as a services business because when I was first starting for Batum, I was talking to Chris Fenster over at Propeller yeah. and he's always been like a friend and a mentor of mine and when we were first talking that was his first piece of advice he like walked me I think they've been in business 10 plus years probably similar length to you guys and he was talking about how repeat founders you know would start coming in and coming yep. in and one of the things he really pointed out or, or made sure to stress to me was that someone you meet may be a customer in six years and yes. you just need to stay in the game. And staying in the game is easy when things are flying and a ton of business is coming your way. But I'm curious for you, not only talking about longevity of the firm, but when things aren't going as fast as you want them to, mm. how do you make sure to say to yourself, all right, it's okay, we can slow down, fix this, but we need to stay in the game. Yeah. I think in service business, longevity is like the biggest benefit of a service business, right? Um, you know, it takes maybe 10 years working all the time 
to become really good at being a lawyer, right? But like, once you've done that, it's like, you could do it till you're 70, 80, 90 if you wanted. You know, like being an athlete, right? Like you can be an athlete till you're like, I don't know, 28, <laughs> you know? And, and then, you, then it gets really, really hard. Like being a, working with your mind, being any service thing, it actually gets easier over time. Um, so that's the one, that's the benefit on longevity, right? Like you gotta have patience. Um, but then taking a long-term view on things, like you just, I think you have to go into a service business or, or, or like a mind share business with a long-term view, right? Because it's an asset that doesn't depreciate that quickly and does appreciate over time. And like, you know, you have to say, if you're, if you're, if you're working at it and it's not hitting immediately, like obviously always be thinking about what you're doing. We, we were always tinkering with our stuff. Like at one point we were like only taking clients that were like doing 3 million in revenue, right? We were just, we've always, been now, now we won't do that. Now we, you know, now we'll take pre-rev if it's kind of the right combination of people, right? Um, but we're always tinkering a little bit to make it work better and to get better offerings and to get better clients. But like, you gotta have patience and you, you gotta have. You have to know that, you know, any sort of mindshare business, and, and you know, Chris is in that business too. Chris is a good friend. You know, you build it up over time. You build that sort of. You build your notoriety up over time, and and you got to think of it as an investment. And look, like every other entrepreneur, so much of success is just not quitting, it's just not quitting. You know, and and it, it it's everybody goes you know, through rough patches. And a lot of times the determination between success and failure is just who quits and who doesn't, you know, who finds an answer and who doesn't. Weren't you going to be a doctor? <laughs> I was. Yeah, I, uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was a molecular and cellular biology major and I wanted to be a surgeon at first. And then I uh, realized I don't like dissecting people. So that uh, kind of took that <laughs> off the table for me pretty quick. And then, um, you know, uh, Tulane, I went to school in New Orleans and uh, I, um, they had a great genetics program. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll work with genetics. Like genetics is kind of like, you know, this is like 99, 2000. Like this is like a hot word. Maybe I'll go into that. Um, and then I worked in a, like a genetic research laboratory in New Haven where I'm from over the summer. I was like 19. And uh, like, it was just like, like so introverted and sterile of a place. I was like, I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> like, I don't know that, it, yeah. like, I don't, like everybody there is, was so introverted and like, it was, a, it was a lab. So like, you had these halogen lights. It was like bright, stark. I was like, I don't know if this is for me. I want to do something. I found out from that, I want to do something that was a lot more interactive with people. Um, but I was like deep down the road at that point. So, you know, I wasn't sure what to do. I uh, ended up actually um, working at and then running a bar in college called F and M's Patio Bar in New Orleans. If anybody goes to New Orleans, check this place out. It's great. It's phenomenal. <laughs> is the boot still there? The boot is still there. The boot's still there. The boot boot was definitely uh, number one for Tulane, but I think F and M's, and I'm probably a little biased, was was definitely number two. Um, and uh, and when I was working there, uh, I started to sort of notice how people's like tastes were sort of moving. I would be doing ordering and like I would be ordering less Miller Lite and like more Obita Amber or like Dixie. And I was like, oh, shoot. OK, people like just sunk in my mind, like people want less mass produced stuff and they want more artisanal stuff. Right. Um, and uh, and I kind of sat there and, you know, I finished uh, college and then I, I actually just stayed in New Orleans and just like ran a bar for a year. And that's, was, awesome. that's a great year. That's yeah, awesome. I mean, it definitely set me up to like work really hard in law school. But um, uh, <laughs> what part of the city was it? In? Uh, it was so it was in Uptown. It was on Chapatulas. It was like nice. right up Uptown from uh, Tipitinas, which is like this famous music. Great place. spot. Yeah, yeah. I think people do underestimate how much you actually learned from that experience. Absolutely. Like it definitely wasn't the thing you're going to retire off of, but. Right. But the tangible skills that you probably learned there that translated into what you've built today, it's like very relevant. Oh, dude, the the interpersonal skills, right? Mm -hmm. And the 
hey, like if you wanna have a big night when the first people come in the bar, like you have to talk to them, like you have to have the music at a certain level, like you have to create an environment where people come and stay. And then like, you know, like when the bachelorette party comes, like you have to like get the guys to buy them a drink so they start talking. So it like creates an environment. Just developing that stuff is in business or in social stuff is so like useful, right? Um, but anyway, so, so I took a year and just did that. And then, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to like buy a bar with like two of my mentors there. And like, you know, I had enough money for it and like cash and like coffee cans, like above my, <laughs> above my kitchen uh, sink or whatever. And they, you know, then the bar was under like a lease and the only leases I'd ever signed or dealt with were like apartment leases. So I was like, oh, what happens in like a year when it comes up, like, what do we do? And I just realized I didn't know enough about business to like start a business, right? So I was like, all right, what am I gonna do? So um, my dad's a lawyer um, and uh, I was like, maybe I'll do law with like medicine or doctors or something like that. So I took the LSAT while I was doing that and you know went to law school and just wasn't totally sure what I was gonna do. But um, when I found you know this firm that Nick was working at in Vitamin Water, like it all kind of, it all kind of, it all kind of came together, right? I was like, oh, here's an opportunity to do something that like people want because people want like you know people are tired of Gatorade, like they want something, and here's something where I can have a competitive moat. Here's something in health and wellness, um, yeah. So just all like just I kind of I didn't know what I wanted to do for a while exactly, but I knew like what I didn't want to do. I found what I didn't want to do by trying stuff, and like I just kept things in the back of my mind and I kept sort of my ears and my eyes open and eventually they all kind of like convalesced somewhere. Yeah. Last question on my end before we wrap is around relationships. And I know you talked about, I mean, you seem like a really natural builder of relationships and specifically deepening relationships. But in business, when you do that for years and years and years, the benefit is that you meet all these great people who it's completely blurred lines. Like yeah. we're friends, we're partners, we do yep. business together, we're clients that's on one hand, an incredibly beautiful and rare thing. On the other hand, how do you keep up with so many folks? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, I haven't had children yet, <laughs> so, Fair so that's one thing. Um, definitely has given me an advantage. Um, but um, I will, look, it's just, I love it. I love people, I love being around people. Um, I'm an extrovert, like being in a crowd people, it gives me energy, it doesn't take energy, right? So like that's an advantage to me because not everybody can say that and some people naturally deplete on it. So I've got more of an affinity for it, but it's also just making the time to do it. Um, I will say that like, even when I'm doing social stuff, like downtime stuff, they're very often times with people that I also do business with, right? So like my, my personal life, my business life is very inextricably intertwined. Um, and it, it is good and bad, right? It allows me to keep up with people. But look, it, business is also business. So sometimes you have hard conversations that like you don't like to have. And most people don't like to have tough conversations when you have to have them with your friends. Um, so you've gotta be open to that, right? And you've gotta be open to giving it and receiving it. Um, but but yeah, that's basically how I, how I manage it. I have one question because I'm sure there's a lot of brand people listening to this. You see everything. What would you say are the biggest trends that you're noticing in like the CPG consumer world today? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one, one sort of thing, I think meat's back. Meat is back in food and bev. You know, you see Hell like, yeah. you know, everything was sort of plant-based, plant alternative, but like people have gone back to meat. Um, I think a macro trend is just like intelligent, nutrition, personalized nutrition, personalized beauty, you know, just like taking data from you and either marketing or developing things directly to you. I think in like 10 years, if we're back here, like there's gonna be, you know, the science isn't really there yet to really get it, but I think 10 years, it might kind of be there. I think 30 years, you know, brands might just be totally personalized. 50 years, I think they definitely will be. Um, so I think like, kind of the more you can touch on those things, especially if you're like in like a, a SaaS or a tech or anything that sort of touches on that, like food tech or whatever, getting into the personalization and like, you know, getting smart about people's individual biomes is probably the smartest thing you can do now. 
Are there any specific brands that you're obsessed with right now? I Oh, I mean, a lot. He's got to be diplomatic in this a response. Lot, a lot, a lot, <laughs> maybe, a lot. maybe to filter, especially like younger brands that just came on the scene. Yeah, younger brands that came on the scene. The Trailblazers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like the guys from Half Day. I really like what mm. they're doing with the T's. Um, uh, I really like Barcode, uh, the, the sports beverage. Um, I really like um, uh, uh, Caldera Labs, like the beauty company, yeah, men's yeah. skincare. It's all over Instagram. I mean, I use it. I mean, I don't. I mean, I, don't blame me for this, but like, <laughs> don't blame them for this. But like, it's a, it's great stuff. Um, yeah, I, and look, I mean, you know, I'm going to fancy foods the next day. I'm hoping to meet a couple other brands that I haven't seen or heard of doing stuff. So, awesome, man. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming on. You want to look at the camera, let everyone know where they can find you. Yep. Uh, hey, I'm Ryan Lewendon. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Ryan Lewendon. You can find me on LinkedIn at Ryan Lewendon. Um, and uh, you can check the website out. It's www.glaw.us. Oh, yeah. Thanks. First lawyer on the pod. Boom. Wrap. There we go. Love it. Awesome. Dude, that was great. <laughs>